We're continuing to analyze uh, evidence questions, and we are analyzing the evidence question from the February 1998 bar involving Phillips and Don and Bernice. And we've come down to the point where Don has confessed to his longtime fiance, but they're not married. So she could be called. <coughs> but uh, at item seven, you notice that Don and Bernice got married. And so that means that the privilege is going to apply to the question of who holds it. As I mentioned to you, some say it's he would hold it, some she would hold it, others they both hold it. But I want to take a moment to distinguish here the privilege that society gives to a spouse not to testify against their spouse in a criminal matter. That uh, that is protecting a different kind of interest than a secret that someone tells their spouse during marriage. So if a person is married and they secretly confess something to their spouse and then they get divorced. Well, now we want a rule which will protect that secret disclosure that was made during marriage. You want that protected forever. So that people feel free to do that. Whereas, in the case here of Bernice and Don, uh, the disclosure was made before marriage. Then they got married. So as long as they are married, if she's got the privilege, uh, she can say, I don't want to testify against them, as long as they're married. But if they ever get divorced, then she no longer has that privilege, and she can be called and say, testify. But if we were talking about something else, about a disclosure made during marriage, those are protected forever if they're made in confidence. Different kind of privilege. Uh, let's go back to item 6 at line 22 August the 15th 1997 Detective Phillips who had been, been present at the June 4th lineup testified at a preliminary hearing that Victor identified Don at the June 4th lineup and Phillips was cross examined by Don's attorney let's be sure we get this clear now Detective Phillips was at the lineup. So since Detective, Detective Phillips was at the lineup, Phillips saw Don point out, pardon me, saw Victor point out Don. Says so that's the person who did it. Number five in the lineup. So Detective Phillips was there and saw Don do that. So that's the equivalent of Detective Phillips hearing Don make an out of court statement that, pardon me, Detective Phillips is out of court and here's Victor. Victor makes an out of court, court statement and Victor says it was Don who did it. So when Detective Phillips testifies that I heard or saw uh, Victor make the identification out of court, that's hearsay. Because Detective Phillips is offering an out-of-court statement by Victor for the truth of what is being offered. So that is uh, uh, that is uh, uh, hearsay when Detective Phillips testifies. Now, since it was hearsay, uh, uh, the, uh, since it was hearsay, Don could have objected to Detective Phillips' testimony on the grounds of hearsay shouldn't be admitted. And you have no hearsay exception. Now, uh, the, there is a hearsay exception for a prior identification of someone. So, for example, if I see someone on the street and recognize them, and then uh, later I'm called to trial to identify that person. Um, I'm sorry, later I... Let's back up for a second. 
Let me suppose I identified someone at a lineup. Okay. I identified Joe at the lineup. Now, um, I come to trial and people ask me, Emerson, who did you identify at the lineup? And I say, gee, I really can't remember. And uh, I don't know if it's one of those people sitting at the defense table or not. Because at the lineup they had beards and had looked different and now the person's all shaved and his hair's cut off and has no beard and is dressed up in a suit and uh, it looks, you know, uh, I'm not, I don't know. And so, if you, but I did identify the defendant at the lineup. And so there's a code section, A01D1C, that says, A01D1C says that I can, uh, uh, I can offer my prior identification. Now my prior identification at the lineup is hearsay. That's an out of court statement offered now for the truth of what it says. But the code says, in the case of identification, uh, I can offer my prior identification of someone so long as I am on the stand and subject to cross-examination about the prior identification. Okay? If I identify someone, I can do that. But this doesn't say that Detective Phillips can testify to what I said out of court. I can testify from there and can be cross-examined. But this is Detective Phillips testifying to what Don said. Okay? And that's hearsay. And there's no real uh, objection, no, no real exception that applies. Some states at, at preliminary hearings will allow that sort of thing so you don't have to have a witness come back from New York to testify at a preliminary hearing then you go back home and a month later they got to come out to trial and testify at the trial. So there are some jurisdictions that will allow hearsay of this type at the preliminary hearing, but uh, not at the trial itself. But in any event, uh, uh, unless we've got something of that sort going on, uh, Detective Phillips is offering hearsay. Don should have objected to it right then. Don did not object. In fact, Don cross-examined. Phillips without raising the hearsay objection. And it's now on the record. So from now on, if you let it in, Don's let it in, you, it's too late. So it's on, the, it's on the court record now. So if you want to use it at another proceeding, you now have reported testimony of something you could have stopped if you had raised the hearsay objection. But Don didn't raise the hearsay objection. So continue. Uh, item 8. Detective Phillips was shot and killed in a hunting accident. So now you know what's going to happen. This testimony of Detective Phillips, they're going to want to use it at trial. Detective Phillips is truly unavailable, and therefore you can probably bring in reported testimony. Well, let's go ahead. Item 9. Don, again, privately confessed to Bernice that he is the one who assaulted Victor. But now, this time, on October the 1st, when Don did that, Don and Bernice are married. And so, at this point, there are two privileges which are active. One is, Don disclosed something to his spouse privately, and that's protected forever, whether they get divorced or not. The other is that she cannot testify against him as long as they are married if the marriage or privilege, if the privilege applies. And it does apply just a question, does she have the privilege or does he have it? Continuing. Item 10, November the 1st. Don and Bernice were divorced. And now that they are divorced, she can testify against him, but she cannot testify about the secrets that he told her during marriage. She can testify about other things. Item 10. Don and Bernice were divorced. Item 12. I don't know what happened to 11. December the 1st, 1997. Victor testifies at trial 
remembering making a line of identification <coughs> but cannot make an in court identification. Okay? So Victor takes a stand. Victor says, yes, I made an identification at the lineup, but I can't make it right now. I can't identify him right now. Well, this 801B1C says that Victor's pre out of court identification is admissible under that exception to the hearsay rule as long as Victor is here on the stand and available for cross examination. But that's not what happened. What happened is at item uh, uh, 12, Victor says, I can't remember. And now comes item 13. This is one of the items that we are asked to analyze. And item 13 says, December the 3rd, for our co prosecution seeks to introduce a certified transcript of the preliminary hearing testimony of Detective Phillips. Well, it probably comes in. It probably comes in because um, uh, Don has had an opportunity to cross-examine Phillips. So normally you'd have a confrontation clause issue, but Don has had an opportunity to cross-examine him, so it probably wouldn't work. Confrontation clause. You have Detective Phillips' hearsay, his te testimony is hearsay, but you have the reported testimony exception to the hearsay rule. So it'll probably come in. It'll probably come in because neither the confrontation clause nor the hearsay exception will keep it out. December the 4th, the prosecution calls Bernice, speaking to have her testify to the August 1st and the October 1 convert confession. And both of them assert marital privilege objections. Well, what you need to do there is explain the two types of marital privileges. One of them uh, is a confidential communication privilege made during marriage, and the other is a privilege to prevent the spouse from testifying against a current spouse. And you point out that they are no longer married now, but uh, the statement that he made to her during marriage is still protected. But the statement he made to her before marriage on August 1st is no longer protected. She could be required to testify. Item 15, December the 8th, the prosecution called a witness seeking testimony as to Victor's reputation for peacefulness in the community. Well, uh, the prosecution is offering testimony that Victor is peaceful um, but that's often character evidence to prove conduct on this occasion. Victor was peaceful in the past, and so he was peaceful on this occasion. But you don't get to do that. To, to use prior conduct to prove conduct on this occasion, except under those three circumstances that are listed under 404, A1, 2, and 3. The accused can put on his or her good character and the prosecution can try to rebut it. If the accused puts on his or her good character, only reputation or opinion is admissible. When the prosecution tries to rebut my evidence of good, my own good character, the prosecution can only use reputation or opinion. So, one of the exceptions when you can use character evidence is, I'm the defendant, I put on my good character, prosecution can rebut. Second situation, where character evidence is admissible, the, uh, I can say, the victim was a very bad dude. Okay. But the prosecution gets to put on evidence that the victim was a very nice dude. But, the prosecution does not, and the, the third situation is where you're saying this is a, uh, to impeach a witness. That's the 404A3, to impeach a witness under 607, 608, 609 
under either of those, uh, you can use uh, character evidence, prior conduct. But what you cannot do is uh, when no one has accused your client of being violent, you can't put on the good conduct. Of, this, is the, this is the victim now. This is not the defendant wanting to put on his good conduct. If the defendant wanted to put on his good conduct, you got to let him do it. Okay. But this is not that. This is the victim. The prosecution is saying, look what a nice person the victim was. But you can't do that unless the victim has been accused. The victim has not been accused. So this uh, item 15 is not admissible. Item 16, December the 9th, the prosecution rests. Item 17, December the 10th, Don testifies in his own defense. Uh -oh. And on cross-examination, prosecution seeks to impeach Don with his 1985 bribery conviction. And the answer is, yeah, that's going to be admissible. Because we talked about this. This is a December the 10th, 1997. And he got out of jail on June the 5th, 1988. And so his 10 years are not up until June the 5th, 1998. And this is still in 1997. So uh, the uh, prior conviction can be brought in to impeach him. Okay. That takes care of that. Now, one of the things we didn't do was to kind of stick to the format that I talked about here. Let's do a couple of these according to the format. Let's start with the one um, at item 14. Item 14, they call Bernice to testify, and she and Don both assert marital privilege. So what objection would you make to, the, their, te to their testimony? I'd say they're, they're, they both may object on the grounds of the confidential communication during marriage and secondly just the marriage itself. Both of those are privileges. So two different objections. The rule. So the rule is that uh, a spouse, that while married, a spouse is privileged not to testify against the current spouse. That in some jurisdictions, the testifying spouse holds the privilege, and others, the defendant's spouse holds the privilege at a criminal proceeding. All this is criminal proceeding. Um, and others, they both hold the privilege. And here, if Bernice does not want to hear, depends on who holds the privilege, whether or not they can make her testify as to, uh, 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 as, as to uh, what was said during... I'm sorry, let me back up a second. Back up. Back here, the rule. Give the two objections. Both of the privileges. Now go to the rule. Well, since there are two privileges, there are two rules. Let's take the first one. The rule of the marital privilege. So you can't make a testify against yourself, but they're not married anymore. And so therefore, she could testify at least as to the August 1st statement. Second rule, uh, comp uh, statements made in confidence during marriage are protected forever. Therefore, the October 1st statement is protected forever. Application, well, we just did the application and the ruling. Same thing with number, uh, ask us to do 17. 17, uh, the con uh, conviction, they want to bring in the bribery conviction. Your objection is that uh, convictions which are more than uh, 10 years old uh, cannot be uh, convictions which are more than 10 years old cannot uh, be used to impeach unless the judge makes a special ruling and here that's the, 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 the senior rule is the objection and the, the uh, senior rule apply our facts it has not been 10 years so that won't stop us from coming in there's one other basis, and that is that 609A1, uh, 609A1 says that if you're going to impeach the defendant himself or herself by a prior conviction, that prior conviction must be more probative of truthfulness than it is prejudicial to the person's present case. 
Well, in this case, the uh, Don is being prosecuted for an assault. And his prior conviction was for bribery. So it does not bias the jury against him in this case in the same way as, for example, if the prior conviction had also been an assault or an attempted murder for some act of violence like that. But here the prior conviction is not related to the present crime. It's just bribery. And so I think the prior conviction is very probative of truthfulness and is not all that prejudicial against his conduct in this particular case. So it should come in. Okay. Let's do July 05. question Oh yes, I'm sorry, I did not make a mistake. July 05, this question, and it's on uh, page 2. This one, page 2. Give you a few minutes to read over to remind us of your notes. I hope you've done the work already. In uh, three minutes, we'll start with page 2. Okay. Now, as we go through these next questions, I think you'll understand the kinds of issues that should have been raised. I want to, now that that's fairly straight, I want to talk about exactly what would you write. And so as we go through the questions, there'll be several places where I'll stop from time to time and say exactly what you would write to make sure that all that's clear. The July 05 question to Dan and his neighbors, it's Dan, not Don, uh, reads as follows. Dan was charged with arson. Now, what you need to think are the elements of arson. And the reason you need to think about the elements of arson is because if, um, uh, 
any evidence which is brought in at this trial must have some logical tendency to prove one of the elements of arson. What is arson? The malicious burning of the dwelling of another. So think about that malicious burning dwelling of another. That's common law arson. Now we know, of course, that's been extended to include other buildings which are not necessarily the dwelling. But uh, when you see Dan has been charged with arson, you should think elements of arson, that's what they, you're going to have to prove. Next sentence. The prosecution attempted to prove that he, Dan, burned down his failing business to get the insurance proceeds. Well, obviously, they're talking about not burning down somebody's uh, not dwelling. This is not a dwelling they're burning down now. It's it's a business structure. So that's okay because we know that uh, the uh, it's a business structure rather than a dwelling. But that's okay. We know that uh, uh, arson now applies to other structures. So the prosecution attempted to prove that Dan burned down his failing business to get the insurance proceeds. It is uncontested that the fire was started with gasoline. Okay? At a jury trial, the following occurred. The prosecution called a neighbor who testified that 15 minutes after the fire broke out, he saw a blue Corvette speed from the scene. Okay? Are we going to let that in? Well, we go through these steps. We, the way we have to determine is, is it, is it relevant? Proper foundation? No exclusions. Well, right now, the neighbor who says, I saw a blue Corvette speed from the scene, we don't know, that's not connected with Dan yet. Dan is the defendant. And so, this evidence, as it stands right now, is not particularly relevant. But um, the uh, uh, um, so there's nothing to object to yet. But it's going to get tied in later. Next paragraph. The prosecution. I mean, I wouldn't say anything yet, is what I'm saying. I would not write anything at this point. In fact, what you're asked at the bottom is that we're just kind of doing analysis as we go along. That what you actually write is what they ask you about. And so don't start writing stuff just because we're talking about it now. You answer the questions. But you need to be analyzing as you go. So as we go, looking at neighbor's testimony right now, it's not relevant because we haven't established that Dan has anything to do with a blue Corvette. But you can imagine that Dan is going to have something to do with a blue Corvette and uh, it's going to end up being wrong. But we weren't asked about neighbor's testimony anyway. If you look at the call of a question at the bottom, you were not asked about neighbor's testimony. So let's continue. Third paragraph. The prosecution next called Detective Fry. Pry testified, now we are asking about Pry's testimony, so we've got to be careful. Pry testified that he checked motor vehicle department records. Okay, so Pry is on the stand, and Pry is saying, I went to the DMV and checked their records. Now maybe I have a computer at my police station, I can check DMV records. But one way or another, I checked the DMV records and I found a little interesting problem here. Uh, th does Pry really know how to check the DMV records? That's something you should be thinking about because Pry is saying I checked them and here's what I found. But does he have the skill that's needed to check those records? Is he using a computer program? Does he know how to do it? So that may be an issue. We'll come to that. He's going. So, Pryor says, I checked the motor vehicle department records and found 
that a blue Corvette was registered to Dan. Interesting. Um, uh, now let's stop there and analyze that. Are you going to allow that testimony in? A blue Corvette belonged to Dan. And the answer is, well, is it relevant? Starting with that. Uh, well, yes, it's relevant that Dan owns a blue Corvette because of what neighbor testifies. So explain that. So in this story, therefore, this testimony logically tends to identify Dan. Therefore, it's relevant. Uh, the um, and is it is it hearsay? Pardon me, it's relevant. Is there a proper foundation? Proper foundation. Well, now we're talking about the foundation for Prior's testimony. Prior's testimony, what he is saying is relevant. Dan owns a blue Corvette. That's relevant. Because it tends to identify him. But the next thing is, is the testimony which Prior is offering to the court. Is that, um, uh, it, do we meet the foundation requirements? If this is a record, a business record, which uh, prior is offering to the court, business record of the Department of Motor Vehicles, and that's basically what he's offering, then shouldn't he bring the record itself? Doesn't the best evidence rule say, bring the record or a certified copy of the record showing that Dan owns a blue Corvette? So the testimony of prior is relevant Yes, on the relevance issue. Second, foundation. The proper foundation for this uh, best evidence rule says bring the document. Okay, we don't have the document. He's telling us what the document says. So his testimony violates the best evidence rule. And furthermore, his testimony is telling us what a record says. But we could use the official records exception to the hearsay rule to bring in what the records say. So we have three things so far. When we come up to line 14, the, uh, the blue Corvette was registered to Dan. Uh, is that testimony relevant? Yes. Proper foundation. Foundation requires to bring the original. We don't have the original. Uh, exclusions, it's hearsay, uh, use the official records exception to the hearsay rule. So the basic point here is that Detective Price's testimony is not admissible because he did not bring the writing. He read it and he's coming to tell us about it. He should have brought the original or made a copy. He got to brought a certified copy. Continuing to read at line 14, Pryor also testified that he observed a blue Corvette in the driveway of Dan's house. And that's the second piece of testimony. We're going to go through the same requirements. Remember on the first piece, Pryor says he owns a blue Corvette because the record shows that it was relevant. Proper foundation was, we did not have a proper foundation. We violated the best evidence rule. And exclusions, hearsay, but official records, but it would have to also have been a certified copy he didn't have that either. Our second item of testimony is that he observed a blue Corvette in Dan's driveway. Is that relevant? Well, does he know where Dan lives? He's assuming facts not in evidence. We don't know where. How do we know which is Dan's driveway? So, if there really is a blue Corvette in Dan's driveway, I think that's relevant to help identify Dan as the person who may have committed the arson. But in order for that testimony to be relevant, we have to establish that our, uh, Officer Pryor, Detective Pryor, really knows where Dan lives. Without that, I don't think it's relevant. So I would explain that. Under relevance, I'd say, Detective Pryor's testimony uh, uh, is relevant if it tends to show that it tends to uh, help identify Dan. If Dan owns a blue Corvette, then that helps identify Dan as the person who may have started the fire. However, 
in our case, Detective Fry, Fryer uh, has not established that he knows where Dan lives. So we don't know that that was Dan's house where Detective Pryor went. He needs to give some explanation as to why he knows where, Pryor, where Dan lives. And without that, his testimony should not be admissible or is not relevant. Uh, foundation, uh, if he, if Detective Pryor can establish that he knows where Dan lives, then yes, he personally saw it there. Personal knowledge is the foundation requirement for a testimony. Just like the foundation requirements for a document are the best evidence rule. Exclusions? There's no reason to exclude what Detective Pryor is saying, not hearsay, or wasn't discovered illegally, so no exclusions. The main problem is that we're not sure Pryor knows where Dan lives. So to summarize Detective Price's testimony, Detective Pryor two sentences. The first one says that uh, a cold blue Corvette is registered to Dan, and we go through these three things about that. And the second one, Detective Pryor says, uh, I saw a blue Corvette in Dan's driveway. You go through the same requirements and say what you have to say about it. Next paragraph. The next paragraph is where Squibe's testimony happens. The prosecution then called Squibe, the bookkeeper for Dan's business. Squibe testified that two months before the fire, Dan told Squire to record some phony accounts receivable to increase his chances of obtaining a loan from the bank. Well, prosecution claims that the motive for burning down the building is that the business was failing and he wanted the insurance money. This tends to prove that the building was failing, that the business was failing. And so this testimony of Scribe is relevant. Proper foundation, personal knowledge, she knows that Dan told her to do this. Here's exclusions. Well, is she is not offering out of court statements of Dan for the truth. She's offering out of court statements for Dan just for the fact that he told her to do this. So we don't have hearsay or any such thing. So once again, then the first part of Scribe's testimony is that Scribe says, Dan told me to make some phony accounts so we could get a loan. You're going to let that in. Is that relevant? Yes, it's relevant to show that Dan was, uh, the business was failing. Now, one of the problems with this is that while this testimony is relevant to show the business is failing, it is also relevant to show that uh, Dan is willing to commit fraud. And prior conduct, trying to defraud the bank, the jury would use that as to say, well, yeah, this person defrauds the bank, of course he would defraud the insurance company also. And so uh, we now have character evidence committing fraud on one occasion as evidence that the person committed fraud against the insurance company. So is fraud against the uh, fraud against the bank going to be admissible to help prove fraud against the insurance company? Well, that is uh, character evidence and the general rule is character evidence is not admissible to show conduct on a particular occasion. However, character evidence is admissible to show motive, common scheme or plan, or modus operandi, uh, lack of mistake, uh, the uh, those kinds of things. Those are those things are listed 404A-B, uh, the so-called mimic rule. So here we have testimony of scribes 
saying, Sean or Dan told me to commit fraud to get money for the business. And while that testimony ought to be admissible to show the business is failing, it should not be admissible to show prior fraud, unless you're claiming common scheme or plan. Maybe you could claim common scheme or plan. Not to show that he committed fraud. You're not using the prior fraud against the bank to prove fraud against the insurance company. Uh, not using it to show uh, to show conduct, but you're using it to show uh, a common scheme or plan. Uh, using it to show uh, that it might work, might not. So, uh, if you're not going to allow the evidence of fraud against the bank to be used to show fraud against the insurance company, then you're entitled to eliminating instruction, telling the jury they cannot use, they can, they can use the attempt to borrow from the bank to fraudulently, they can use that to show the business was failing, but they can't use it to show propensity to commit fraud. And that's a close call, but that's what you could say. So relevance? Yes. Uh, phoning up the books is relevant to show the business is failing, okay, and, it may not, and it's admissible for that purpose, but it is also relevant to show fraud, and it's not admissible to show fraud on one occasion means fraud on the next. Foundation Squad has personal knowledge that Dan told her this. Exclusions, there aren't any, there's no hearsay or anything. So, the, well, there's this one exclusion that we talked about up here, 105. 105 says you, you can ask the court to tell the jury that you can, you can, uh, that that the uh, attempt to defraud the bank is admissible only to show that the business was failing, not to show this person has a tendency to commit fraud. I don't see how a jury could follow that instruction, but you could ask for it. Continuing with scribe's testimony, we're at line 19. Scribe then testified that she created the records and accounts receivable for a fictitious entry in the amount of $250,000. So she did it. Does it matter that she did it? The main thing, showing the business was going, was failing, is that he asked her to do it, to try to borrow some money. So I'm not sure that um, the fact that she did it is relevant. But we continue. It says the bank denied the loan anyway. So that evidence, is that relevant? She did it and the bank denied the loan anyway? Well, yes. It shows that he has a strong motive to try to get money from some other source because he didn't get it the way he thought he was going to get it. Foundation, does she have personal knowledge that the bank denied the loan anyway? She has personal knowledge that she doctored the books. But I don't know that she has personal knowledge that the bank denied the loan anyway. Uh, so. Well, that's a possible problem. Exclusion. Uh, the, uh, well, again, it shows an attempt to commit fraud, and this is admissible to show the business was failing, but it's not admissible to show that if he was going to commit fraud against them, he'll commit fraud against the insurance company, unless you can make a common scheme or plan out of that. I don't think you can. Continuing. Squad further testified that two days after the fire, Dan again told her to create some phony accounts, but she refused to do them this time. And so, uh, you, you're looking at maybe a common scheme or plan, but uh, otherwise, when she says, Dan asked me to do it a third time, or a second time, asked me to do it again, and I refused, well, the fact that Don, Dan asked her to do it again, does that, is that relevant? Is that relevant to show the business was failing? I guess so. Um, she says, I refused to do it the last, the second time. Um, 
Does that, does that tend, I refuse to do it. Does that tend to show the business is failing well? It tends to show that he's now, where's he going to get the money from this time? Can't use the phony books to get money from the bank. And so, I don't know, I mean, you can make a case for maybe it's relevant. Foundation, she seems to have personal knowledge, no exclusions. I just so. Uh, finally, the next paragraph, the prosecution called Jim, called Jan. Jan is the janitor. The prosecution called the janitor, who was the night janitor at uh, the Dan's business, to testify that the evening before the fire, as janitor was walking past Dan's office, Janitor heard a male voice say, quote, Gasoline is the best fire starter. Whoa. Now, if you can pin that statement on Dan, it now uh, tends to uh, identify Dan as the person who started the fire. It has some tendency to identify Dan. Um, you might also call it the person's declaration of their present state of mind. I intend to start a fire. That's stretching it a little bit, but that's so the possible I intend to start a fire or um, just the fact that he was uh, talking about starting fires with gasoline the day before the fire started and it was a gasoline fire, certainly tends to have some tendency to identify him. So the statement is relevant because it has some tendency to identify Dan. It's relevant if it was Dan speaking. Was it Dan speaking? What do we know? Well, we know it was a male voice. And it says here that Jan knew Dan's voice. But because the office door was closed and the voice was muffled, Jan could not testify that the voice was Dan. Well, I don't think it matters. If Dan is in the office with somebody, it's Dan's office after hours. So if Dan is in the office with somebody talking about starting a fire with gasoline, that tends to identify Dan as the person who did it or conspired with someone else to do it. So that testimony of janitor is relevant to identify Dan. Foundation, uh, the, um, he has personal knowledge that this happened in the office, but he does not have personal knowledge that it was Dan. But that's okay. The jury, he, he, uh, uh, the jury can work on that. He's testifying not that it's Dan. He's testifying that in Dan's office, after hours, I heard this conversation. And so he, he, uh, and that, that is relevant, and he has personal knowledge that that happened, and there's no reason to exclude any of that. So that's how this question would be dealt with. When we come back from our break, we're going to do another question. Uh, this time we will do the one um, uh, from the July 2000 bar. Question from the July 2000 bar. The next one we'll do. page 9 and let's come back at 10 minutes after and at 10 minutes after I will assume you have read this question assume that you have done the homework before class anyway but if 
season, so we'll start at 10 o'clock, assuming the questions have been read.